So a little video here on buffers. This is gonna be more qualitative and helping you think about how to do calculations. And then I have another uh, video that's posted on Blackboard. I don't want you to watch that one yet. I want you to try to work through the buffer calculations problems before you watch the solution video, um, but use the solution video to check your work or if you get stuck. So if you haven't figured this out already, buffers are really important in biochemistry. We're talking about them in lecture and understanding how we buffer the blood through respiration and through metabolic activity. Uh, we have a case study to help us understand that. And in lab, buffers are really important because usually we do our biochemical reactions in a buffered solution to make sure we minimize changes in pH. So to review a little bit about what buffers are, we need to think again about some acid-base chemistry. So this should be a review, but to kind of have this all in one place here. If we think about what happens if we add a strong acid or a strong base to a solution, the chemistry that's gonna happen depends on what is in our solution and that, what those molecules are able to interact with. So if we think about just adding pure uh, strong acid or strong base to water, right? The environment that's there is that we're basically gonna only have H2O molecules there. And if we're adding um, strong acid or strong base, we're gonna directly change the H3O plus or OH minus concentration. And hopefully you guys remember that these two sort of work together. Remember H3O plus times OH minus equals KW. So if we talk about increasing H3O plus, we're actually decreasing OH minus. They work kind of in an inversely relational way. But again, if we've got nothing in solution except for pure water, when we add strong acid or strong base, we're gonna change the pH significantly. And we can see that if we look at a couple equations here, right? If we add a strong acid, we're basically adding H3O plus. The only thing available in solution is water. We really just end up doing a proton exchange here. But at the end of the day, on the right side of the equation, we have H3O plus, which means we are going to be changing the pH, in this case, decreasing it, it becomes more acidic. And if we add acid, we've got OH minus. So again, another proton exchange reaction, but at the end of the day, our reactant or our, our product side is going to have an increase in the concentration of OH minus, and that means our pH is going to be increasing. So without the ability of any other chemistry there, the only option is to change OH minus or H3O plus concentration, which means we're changing pH. So what happens then if there is something else in solution. What if we have one of those buffered solutions? So again, if we've got a weak acid and its conjugate base in solution, those can do chemistry with the added H plus or OH minus, and that's going to minimize the changes to pH. Notice I say, said it doesn't prevent changes in pH. It just sort of helps to mitigate it or allow for those changes to be minimal. So looking at these same equations here, right? If we added H3O+, plus, but now there is a conjugate base of a weak acid in solution. This guy you can think of as being a proton sponge. It's a soldier that's gonna do chemistry with added acid. It's gonna sop up that proton and it's gonna leave water. But importantly, if we look at what's on the right side of the equation here, we don't have H3O+, plus, we don't have OH-, minus, so we really haven't changed those species concentrations directly. Now what we have changed is we have changed the amount of A minus and HA. And when we think about the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and we talk about it in a little bit, that's where that subtle change in pH is gonna come from. So I'll revisit that in a minute here. Again, if we add base, now what's gonna happen is that OH minus, oops, this should not be H2O plus here, copy and paste error. If we've got HA that's here, so this is gonna be HA, Okay. What's going to happen is we're going to generate uh, water and then we're going to leave behind A minus. So sorry about that there. So the point is, is that if we look at the right side of the equation here, we don't have an addition of OH minus or H3O plus to the solution. We had our weak acid here serving as a soldier to do battle with and react with a hydroxide so that we leave behind just water and now a little bit more a minus. So again, we've changed the amount of HA and A minus that we have. That's where we're going to have a slight change in pH, but ultimately we are not changing the concentration of H plus and OH minus. And that's the key to minimizing changes in pH. All right, so a little bit of qualitative stuff on buffers here, right? Buffers are resistant to changes in pH from the addition of either acid or base. And that's again because that chemistry that happens, 
That acid or base is going to encounter that solute that's able to undergo chemistry. So again, that weak acid or that conjugate base is going to do chemistry with whatever we've added, and so we're minimally changing the actual H3O plus or OH minus concentration in solution, changing the concentrate or changing the pH very minimally. So I actually this looks like I've got sort of a duplicate here. I apologize for this. Uh, I, again, this slide looks like it's a little bit of a duplicate, but just reminding us here at the bottom, I like to call buffers pH guardians, right? They're going to provide a molecule, that army, capable of performing some chemistry so that we change pH minimally. I got a lot of redundancy there. Sorry about that. Looks like this was a slide that I meant to delete. So let's talk about how buffers work, and we're going to build up this qualitative piece to eventually get to how do you do calculations with buffers, okay? So this is a slide that we saw in lecture, right? If we think about having an army that has both weak acid and its conjugate base, the addition of uh, an acid is going to cause reaction with the base army. We're going to deplete that a little bit, and then we're going to increase the concentration of our acid army. But importantly, we don't have a change in H3O plus concentration because we've eliminated it from the population, but we do have a slight change in the ratio of our armies that's going to create a slight change in our pH. Converse is true over here in terms of going the opposite direction. If we have additional hydroxide that we've added, that's going to react with our weak acid here. That army is going to go down a little bit. We're going to make a little bit more of our conjugate base army. But importantly, because we've eliminated any hydroxide in solution, that's not going to contribute to a change in pH. What will contribute to a slight change in pH is the fact that the ratio of our acid our weak acid to our conjugate base army is going to be changing. So that's stuff that we covered in lecture already, kind of revisiting in lab. We talked a little bit about buffer capacity in lab, so I want to just kind of, or in lecture, I want to highlight it again here. We can define buffer capacity as the ability to resist changes in pH from the addition of hydroxide ions. So even though our buffers will kind of work against both an acid or a base attack, buffer capacity is actually defined specifically by kind of resisting an attack by base. And so two situations are going to allow us to have the best buffering capacity. You can think of a buffering capacity as how long can I withstand an attack before it's going to be problematic. And when I say how long, I'm not putting a time standpoint, but how much acid or base could I add before I'm no longer able to do that chemistry that allows us to buffer. So if we look here at A, A is a situation that's an ideal buffer. We've got a relatively high concentration of our weak acid and our conjugate base, and they're in relatively equal amounts. So these are, by definition, the two things we want to look at if we want to have an ideal buffer. Concentrations of HA and A- are relatively equal. That's what we have here. And then they're relatively large. So what we have sort of in this B and this C situation are two different scenarios that kind of allow us to not really be the best buffer or not have great buffering capacity. In the B situation here, we've really skewed the amount of each species that we have. So in that case, we've kind of failed this first test. We don't have concentrations that are relatively equal to one another. So even though the total amount might be similar to what we have here, they're really kind of skewed so that we're very acid heavy and we're really not able to handle attack by acid because our weak base, our conjugate base army is so small. Looking over here, we have an army that satisfies the first criteria. We have concentrations that are relatively equal, but unfortunately we don't have concentrations that are relatively large. So in this case, this is not going to be a great buffer because very quickly our army can be overcome by an attack by either acid or base and we're going to deplete that army. So buffering capacity, best buffer, has relatively equal concentrations of our weak acid and its conjugate base, and it's relatively large in terms of concentration. This plays into some things that we've talked about before with how do you choose the best system for your buffer? If you've chosen a buffer, see if this makes sense, if you've chosen a buffer where the weak acid has a pKa that is at the pH you want to be at, by definition, you will have relatively equal amounts of HA and A minus. Now, if you've chosen a weak acid system, a weak acid and its conjugate base, where the pKa is more than um, one, P one unit away from the pH that you want to be at, that's where you're going to start getting into this situation, where you're going to be either acid heavy 
or base heavy because you're asking that system to live at a pH that's much different from its pKa. All right, Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, we've seen this lots, right? We're gonna talk about it with our case study. We're gonna have a couple of examples. Use it in lab. It's a really important equation, one that you need to know, okay? So pH equals pKa plus the log of A minus over HA. Four variables that we have in that and all play a role in kind of buffer chemistry. We've already talked about pH as a property of the environment, right? And it reflects changes in either OH minus concentration or H3O plus concentration. So pH being a property of the environment. pKa is a property of the molecule. And again, this is gonna be of the weak acid that we are choosing for our buffer system. It really reflects that molecule's tendency to hang on to its acidic proton. In lecture, we talked about using these two pieces of information to determine protonation state, right? So in the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, pH is ultimately not only a reflection of how tightly a weak acid wants to hold on to its proton, but pH is a reflection of what's the relative concentration of both of those species, okay? So again, this equation reminds us that pH uh, of a solution containing buffering compounds is a reflection of both the inherent tendency of a molecule to remain bound to its acidic proton, that's that pKa value, as well as the relative amounts of each component, right? And if these two components are equal, this becomes a one, the log of one is zero, so the pH will be equal to the pKa of that weak acid. All right, we're gonna go through how we're gonna prepare buffers. We're gonna talk about preparing buffers conceptually. We're gonna walk through the calculations, and then we're gonna talk about, well, what does that mean once you get these numbers for what you do in lab? So kind of a three-part thing here. So the first way that you can prepare a, a buffer is what I'm calling method one. It's creating a two-component buffer. We're gonna mix equal amounts of a weak acid and its conjugate base. Seems super simple. The pro of that is you're gonna pretty much be close to whatever your target pH is based on what you calculate for the concentrations of H A and A minus. So you're likely to not need to do a lot of adjusting at the pH meter. However, sort of a con for this is you have to make sure that you have two things in lab. You have to have the weak acid and its conjugate base. And remember, we never grab bottles of anions off the shelf. They're going to be salts. So we're gonna usually have a sodium or potassium salt of that conjugate base because sodium and potassium salts are always soluble. Those solubility rules from general chemistry. So that's kind of um, a common way to do it, but oftentimes people will use the second method because it's a little bit simpler in terms of what you need to do in the lab. It's what we call a single component buffer. What you're gonna do is start with either HA or A minus, and then you're going to make the missing component in the lab, we call this in situ, in the mixing pot, by using either strong base or strong acid, depending on which way you wanna go. And I'll just highlight here that the strong bases that we usually use are the sodium salts, uh, sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, and strong acid is usually HCl. So let's see if this makes sense. Method one is really using both of these that you'd have already in the lab. Method two says, you know what? I'm gonna start with 100% of the weak acid, and then I'm gonna add some hydroxide to convert some of this HA into the A minus. So I'm gonna take about half of it and convert it into A minus, and then I'm gonna leave half of it as is, and that's how I'm gonna get that 50-50 mix. You could come at it from the other direction and say, you know what? I'm gonna start with 100% of my conjugate base. And then I'm gonna titrate in, shouldn't say titrate, I'm gonna add in some acid so that I'm gonna take some of this and make it into its protonated form, leaving about half of it still in its deprotonated form, and that's how I'm gonna make my ideal buffer. So some pros of this is basically you only need to have one thing in the lab. You're actually gonna be making the second thing in your mixture, okay? Fewer calculations because you only have to really think about having calculations for one species. The cons of this, and we're gonna have a little bit of a meaty problem that goes into this, is you have to adjust the pH. You aren't going to be at the correct pH because basically you're starting all the way on the left or the right of your ideal buffer sort of composition. You're gonna to have to spend a significant amount of time at the pH meter. We'll talk about one of the calculations that I'm gonna ask you to do is to think about pre-calculating the amount of hydroxide that you might need to add if you started with a pure acid solution, 
how much of this are you going to need to add before you get to this ideal solution? And the reason I'm going to have you do that is, remember when you did titrations in, in, in lab and gen chem? That first titration, you had to go painfully slow because you didn't know how much you could add. I want you to calculate roughly how much you'd need to add before you predict that you'll start getting close. Okay? Think about that calculation. And again, I've got a worked out video to help you work through the solution if you get stuck. All right, so let's walk through how do you do buffer calculations? I'm going to walk you through a strategy that I think works pretty well, um, and hopefully it'll, it'll make sense. If we're doing anything with buffer calculations, we always need two equations. Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is the first, and then the second equation is the total concentration of solute as a combination of HA, our weak acid, and its conjugate base. So let's see if this makes sense. We know that there's four variables in our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. We know the pH that we want to be at. We're making a buffer to be at a specific pH. We should have chosen a weak acid whose pKa is close to that pH. So we're going to know the pKa value. And so if we know those two pieces, this Henderson-Hasselbalch equation will allow us to calculate the ratio of these two species. Okay. Now I want to highlight this is a relative amount. We're going to get a number that gives us the relative amount of our weak acid and our conjugate base. There's lots of things that could satisfy that same ratio. Let me flip back here for a second. And I know I've got some words there that highlight this. This guy and this guy, they both have the same relative amounts of HA to A minus. They're equal, right? That ratio would be one. But the absolute amounts are different. We have way more in this solution than we do in this. That's what makes this a better buffer. Buffering capacity isn't as good there. So again, in this case, um, when we want to think about what we get from just using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, we can get the relative amounts of our weak acid and our conjugate base, but that doesn't help us do anything physically in lab. We need to know the absolute amounts so that we can go waste something out on the balance, right? So what we need to have then is we've got two variables in one equation. Can't solve for two variables with one equation. If you have two variables, as long as you have two equations, you can solve that. So let's see if these calculations make sense. You might need to work through them yourself to see that this works. So this is how you're going to solve a two variable buffer calculation problem. This is just a suggestion, but I think if you're a little bit fuzzy on how to make this work, I think this will make sense. Okay, so first step, put your pH and your pKa values into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. You're going to solve that equation for A minus in terms of HA. So let's see if we get this. These two are going to be numbers, so we're going to end up with a number over here equal to the log of that fraction. Use 10 to the you know anti-log to kind of get rid of it. You're going to get some number equals a ratio of that concentration. You're going to solve for A minus. So you're going to move HA over to the other side, and you're going to have some number times HA equals A minus. So again, HA is going to be equal to, or A minus is going to be equal to some number times HA. Okay. Now you're going to take and plug this variable of version A into equation 2. So this is also a two variable equation, but if we solve this one for A minus in terms of HA and then we put it into this guy, now everything's in terms of HA, we can solve that equation for the concentration of HA. And now that's going to be an absolute number. It's not a relative number, it's an absolute number. So hopefully that makes sense between the differences in those two terms. Now that we know exactly what HA concentration is going to be, we can plug it back into this equation. Simple math there to get the concentration for A minus. Now we have actual real numbers for the specific absolute concentration of HA and the specific absolute concentration of A minus. Now this becomes like those you know, uh, calculations that we did in the first week of our lab math, right? Where we started thinking about, well, if I want to make a solution that's this concentration, how do I actually grab something off the shelf and do that? So again, it becomes like those first few questions we had in lab math. So let me actually run through what that really means, a little bit of a review here. How would you actually make these solutions in lab based on what you have as starting materials, right? If you have a solid that you're going to use, 
Most of the conjugate bases, as they're sodium or potassium salts, are going to be solids we grab off the shelf. So you're going to need to use the molecular weight, whatever the final volume of your buffer is, to determine how many grams of that stuff we grabbed off of the shelf are we going to need to weigh out to add to make our solution. If you've got liquids, then we're doing dilutions, right? We can use our dilution equation to determine what's the volume of that concentrated strong acid, for example, acetic acid, that we're going to need to grab to use. Then what we're going to do is once you've figured out the actual amounts you'll weigh on the balance or that you'll measure out with a pipette or a, a burette or a, a graduated cylinder, we're going to add these solutions, and again it depends whether you have one or two, whether you're making a one or two component buffer. I want you to add them to a beaker and add water, quantity sufficient to be about 80% of the total volume. Okay, And the reason we leave a little bit of room, we don't go right to our volumetric flask, is we need to be able to adjust the pH. So a good rule of thumb is you can usually probably get up to about 80% of your total volume. That makes sure you leave enough room to add however much acid or base that you might need to adjust the pH. So again, you're going to adjust the pH with acid or base accordingly, depending on whether you need to go up or down in your pH. Get to your desired pH. Now what you do is you add that pH adjusted solution to whatever size volumetric flask you based your calculations on. Add water quantity sufficient to get to the line on your volumetric flask. And now you've made your buffer. The reason we go to about 80% before we adjust it is just in case there's a little bit of funkiness that could be happening. If, you're, if your water that you're using isn't exactly pH 7, um, you could have a shift in pH as you add in more water. All right, summary of buffers, right? Buffers are made from weak acids and its conjugate base, and you must match them. We can't choose a weak acid like acetic acid and then choose the conjugate base like carbonate. They have to be a matched pair, and ideally you choose a weak acid whose pKa is near the pH you want to be at. Step one, just qualitatively remembering why we're making buffers. They're pH guardians. They sacrifice themselves to whatever is being added to minimize changes in pH. So our weak acid army will combine with any added base that's added. Our uh, conjugate base army is going to combine, and I've got copy and paste up here, is going to combine with any added acid. So that's, again, going to be H+. We're going to have the best capacity for our buffer when we satisfy those two criteria. The concentrations of HA and A- minus are relatively large and relatively equal. So just a rule of thumb, if you have a buffer that's less than 10 millimolar, it's probably not going to be doing a good job in our buffering capacity. Remember when we had over here our little C buffer? You get, you get down here, you're getting you know single digit millimolar or even micromolar amounts. That's not sufficient to effectively buffer pH, not good capacity. So again, we can make these buffers by either combining uh, uh, both components, right, and that two-component buffer, or we might only have one of the components that we're going to create the other one sort of in situ. We always want to think about adjusting pH. Maybe we have to adjust it a lot because we have a single component buffer. That's going to, again, require a, a, a greater pH adjustment. But once we've adjusted the pH, put it in your volumetric flask, dilute to wherever mark uh, there is on that volumetric flask, and you're good to go. All right, so that's buffers. You have a few calculations to play with, both in your lecture homework as well as your lab math homework, to deal with making buffers. So try them on your own, but again, I do have video solutions posted on Blackboard for these ones for lab math. Good luck.